This series of videos introduces the 38 chapters of the Routledge Handbook of Environmental Movements. It's a project of the Social Change Lab, and we gratefully acknowledge the support of the Mary Lee bequest for the work of our team. Hi everyone, I'm Winifred Lewis. I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Queensland. And I am Shu, and I am a psychology student at the University of Queensland. And what we're doing today is we're making recordings for all 38 chapters of the Routledge Handbook of Environmental Movements. And in particular, we are working on chapter seven, Middle East and North Africa, civil society and environmental activism in the Arab world. And the author of the chapter is Salpi Jundurian. Hope I pronounced that correctly. And of course, um, just alt tabbing, um, their background is that they are a, an associate professor of economics in the Adnan Kassar School of Business in the Lebanese American University. And I guess one um, point that the author makes right at the start is the reason why the Middle East and North Africa are grouped together is because um, that's those are the areas that are uh, majority Arab uh, in his, history and background, and that the social movements in the Arab world are often combining environmental and social themes. Um, it's hard to disentangle the two. And part of the reason for that is the history of the region. And because the readers might not know that history, um, they start. the author starts off with a kind of broad historical background. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that, Shu. So the broad historical background that the author uh, wants you to see too, um, the author, first of all, drills down into the origins of uh, how social and environmental activism grew within the region. And um, a lot of this uh, comes from the uh, educated um, upper class and religious leaders of uh, these countries, uh, for example, Iraq, Egypt, Lebanon, and Syria, and members of the royal families in Jordan and Morocco. They um, did the uh, so-called, you know, um, celebrity charity thing and initiated and sponsored various um, welfare societies within the Arab world for philanthropic purposes. And this gave rise to a plethora of private volunteering opportunities and community-led organizations to support development, human rights, and environmental protection. Yeah, that's right. And I guess the, the context is really that um, the colonial uh, era as well with, um, you know, the major uh, countries occupied by Britain and um, France and other countries and then regaining independence and um, going into, you know, the 60s and 70s, um, forming new governments and, and in that context, all this civil society forms. And then um, um, I guess when they're looking at the mobilization in the 70s, um, the author talks a little bit about how themes of environmental degradation and pollution um, started coming to the fore. And here you saw a bit more mobilization potentially by some community led groups and um, advocating for change, but in the context of um, you know, mixed results is how the author describes it. So sometimes they were successful in reversing unpopular environmental strategies, but, uh, and sometimes there were political reforms that were introduced like in the eighties, but oftentimes the protesters attracted repression and even state violence, um, witnessing like many arrests and um, even uh, deaths. And in the 1990s, the author then um, says there's a sort of increasing growth of welfare NGOs and what's called social Islam to meet the needs unmet by the state. So the idea is that um, the government's been forced to cut services by uh, programs that are imposing austerity on them. And then um, religious organizations and charities step into that gap. But at the same time, um, the political Islamic groups, which are sometimes speaking out against the government, are um, also being violently repressed and operating largely outside the state because of, um, you know, that that uh, closed political structure. And um, there are another factor that the author talks about is that sometimes the so-called um, community organizations are really almost branches of the state. As, can you tell us a bit about that, Shu? Sure. 
Right. So in terms of how these organizations can be extensions of the state, uh, parts of this are also uh, related to the fact that with uh, no growth and an expansion of uh, some of these uh, countries as um, the oil economy, uh, amongst other things, became more prominent in uh, global uh, society, the um, respective governments of each country uh, provided some leeway, some uh, liberalization to um, uh, gather and garner support so that they can still remain in power and so that they can still uh, provide some sort of uh, symbol to its uh, residents to say that, you know, um, this is development and this is development coming to you and uh, you yeah, have- Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm gonna right. jump in there, jump in there and say that definitely is a theme and I wanna um, come back to it in a second, the idea of sustainable development and how that's kind of mixed for the environment and for communities, some, some good, some questionable. But I wanted to highlight a point we were talking about earlier, which was um, some of the charities are actually run by the state. Um, so even though they're, community-led organizations. Um, they're tightly um, policed by the state and sometimes people would actually come like police officers or state officers go to all the meetings. So um, in particular, many of the countries had um, regional associations or neighborhood associations that would do a lot of charitable work and some environmental work, but um, they would do it in the context of not being fully independent. So they wouldn't be able to necessarily speak out if the government is supporting development in a way that's unsafe for communities. So mm -hmm. let's go back to your point though, which is an important one and which is also happening at this point in the 70s and, and 80s is this trend towards um, sustainable development. So the idea that part of environmental growth has to be um, growth in jobs and people having livelihoods. Can you, what have you got in your notes about that or what? What comes to your mind about that? All right. So um, in relation to uh, all of these, there are unfortunately uh, situations uh, that result in social inequity in um, parts of the region. And this has prompted um, grassroots uh, movements to spring up protests amongst uh, the educated uh, younger generation within these countries to demand government action and perhaps um, any local action to even address these inequities. Now, some of these would include the uh, You Stink um, movement that rallies uh, members of our society, NGOs and environmental groups um, to look at the garbage crisis that came out of uh, a so-called urban encroachment issue. Yeah, that was really interesting, wasn't it? There's quite a detailed case study of the Lebanese environmental movement. Um, particularly after the civil war. So for those that don't have these details at their fingertips, Lebanon was embroiled in civil war for um, more than 15 years. And at the end of the war, um, the government that formed on the one hand was a bit more liberal as she was saying that allowed lots of different civil society groups to operate, but also was not very effective in addressing even basic needs like garbage collection. So uh, this Ustink protest, is about how um, the garbage was literally piling up in the streets and people were getting sick um, and dying of communicable diseases because of waste in, and um, poor waste management. And this is also a play on words because the protesters are saying part of the reason why this is happening is because the political elite is corrupt. So they're saying you stink to the political elite that they're corrupt. And this theme that there's a mismanagement of the environment that has implications for communities, poverty and health is really part of the environmental protests of the, of the region. That's a point that the author makes. Um, there's a few other details that are put um, along here as we kind of move along. Um, like there's, there's new regional formations that were growing um, in part when, um, because of this idea of sustainable development that, uh, that people in the developing countries were going to increase their economy at the same time as protecting their environment. There's a lot of international ENGOs and international development organizations that wanted to work in partnership. So there's kind of a push from the outside um, to get some of these groups to form and to, to legitimize their activities. 
um, but at the same time, um, and they were, you know, conducting education and lobbying, but at the same time, there's often um, not a full translation or implementation of these themes and concerns. And even to this day, the political opportunity structures in the area remain relatively closed. I think that's that's fair to say as a take home um, point from the chapter, right? That um, this region highlights um, the difficulty of mobilizing in that um, context. And another point that the author makes earlier on in the chapter that I think is just really important is that almost all of the governments in this area of the world draw their power in part from extracting resources, especially oil. So um, that has kind of from the outset meant that these decisions are incredibly politicized and that power over the oil has always been you know, carefully controlled by the ruling elites. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. What are some other um, takeaway uh, messages or thoughts that you have about the chapter, Shu, as we move towards wrapping up? It is quite interesting because uh, the environmental movement in the region seems particularly fragmented. And a lot of the issues that seem more front of mind in Arab society tend to be uh, other kinds of uh, socioeconomic uh, concerns. However, mm -hmm. um, another thing that seems to be a hurdle is uh, the presence of a kind of you know, protest culture that has somewhat been curtailed in many uh, Arab countries, but has recently been seen in places such as um, Lebanon, where uh, young urban educated individuals are pushing for uh, an improvement in local opportunities and local uh, you know, civil infrastructure and social rights. Yeah, there's so much to unpack in what you just said. Like, one of them is about how the young people at present, like everywhere else, are connected into a global culture, and they're wanting to participate in that and to have the, what other people have. Mm -hmm. Another point is that the you know there's this real wave of protests that the author talks about in 2011, the Arab Spring, where around the around the um, area, people asked for rights and sometimes got small steps forward, but often got, you know, rebuffed by um, dictatorial and authoritarian governments and, and brutally repressed. And so that's the context in which everyone's operating. And then the other um, point is that um, the civil society organizations, you know, are often not connected to each other across the countries. And that makes it hard, um, but it's also a, a function of the coercive policing and surveillance and repression of those movements. Um, so I think those are all important points that the author talks about. Mm -hmm. Another point I would say um, is that it does seem to be the case that there is a lack of scholarship into this. And as we saw in some of the other chapters, um, like when we we're talking about earlier today, I was recording a chapter on the anti-nuclear movements in China and Russia. Like it is very hard to sometimes have not just protests, but the scholarship of those protests mm -hmm. um, in repressive regimes. And so um, there's a real scope for, for further work and, and important work like this chapter um, by this author and others to move forward. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, building these national case studies is gonna be a way forward and also developing those comparative analysis of the region and the different countries in the region. I guess for me too, it was, I was, it's fair to say I knew in almost nothing about the environmental movement in the Middle East and North Africa. So I really appreciate the opportunity to learn a bit more and, and maybe that's a good place to end as well, right? It is, yes. And given uh, the fact that uh, perhaps a majority of the Arab world are uh, Muslim, there is also a trend towards uh, reaching out to uh, the people on the basis of eco-theology to help uh, drive a stronger uh, environmental movement and a sense of pride and protection for the environment. Yeah, thank you for raising that. That's true. That's a final point in the chapter by the author and um, highlighting um, that just as in the Christian theology, you know, there's these tensions between the theology of stewardship and domination, like whether we get, we're supposed to take care of the planet or dominate mm -hmm. over it. So too, in the Muslim world, there's all different theologies and there's a new eco-theology and when that theology stresses that um, not just humans, but nature is part of Islam, then there's a lot of religious mobilization for the environment. And um, that's a very important um, point and a, hopefully a positive one in this local context. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll say thank you to you, Shu, for participating in the recording. And um, I've enjoyed learning about the chapter today as well as the others. And I'll say thank you to our viewers if you're here with us today to the end. Bye now. Bye. For those of you watching, be sure to subscribe and follow us at Social Change UQ. And check out our website for more videos.